I think one of the reasons why plant medicines are so powerful is because they're really interested in the evolution of everything. And they, they like want, they leave nothing out of their invitation to transform and evolve. So everything is welcome at the table of a psychedelic, everything, every shadow, everything that's hidden, every secret, every blind spot. Part of their power is that they make us feel more comfortable looking into the shadow aspects of our own self and therefore the shadow aspects of society. And in my experience, one of the biggest shadows in society is money. So I think that it makes it makes perfect sense to me that the plants would like to get their hands on money because in the end, money is just a form of energy. It just happens to be a form of energy that's fraught with a lot of conflict right now. Hey, listeners, and welcome back to Third Wave's podcast. Today, we have Sylvia Benito. Sylvia is a portfolio manager with 20 years of experience in managing family office investments. She began her career as an entrepreneur co-founding a startup in South America, the Oasis Institute, which she successfully exited before becoming a professional investor. Sylvia connects consciousness to capital by bridging the traditional world of investing to her proprietary innovations in quantifying the alignment, awareness, and transformative purpose of any company. She works with families, founders, and boards to adjust alignment to their highest and truest purpose, and in doing so, creates chains of abundance that benefit the common good. Sylvia holds her CFA charter and is trained in family governance and systems. She is also a trained shaman and actively investigates the utilization of entheogens in investing. Sylvia, welcome to the podcast. It's great to have you. Thank you for having me today. Absolutely. So I first heard about your work uh, at the Microdose Conference in Miami that was about Uh, five weeks ago or so from the date of this recording. And what you were talking about was really interesting, which was this relationship between investment and personal entheogenic experiences. And that's a very sort of deep topic. And I don't want to just throw you into that right away. So I'd love to just start by um, having a a broader perspective of of your work in the space and and specifically starting with with your path to awakening. And when did that path to awakening begin for you? What, What was sort of the context around it? The first experience that I had of awakening was accidental. I was in college and somebody went and picked some psilocybin mushrooms and we were going to go to a party. At the time, I didn't smoke pot. I didn't drink. I didn't have any experience really of any kind of altered consciousness at all. I was 19. I partook of some mushrooms. If I had to guess, it was a way heroic dose, although of course I didn't know that at the time. And I started walking to the party with my then boyfriend. And as I was walking, I remember looking at some trees and seeing their their magnificence for the first time. And then I just peed in my pants. And I said to him, wow, how come we just don't always pee when we feel like it's time to pee? Like, why do we control anything at all? And that was the portal then into what became a very, very profound awakening experience in which I saw that my thoughts create my reality, that everything is made of God, that consciousness is the only thing that matters, that we're on this planet to wake up. And I was able to kind of touch into uh, the energy of infinity which for me, being 19 years old at a college party with my boyfriend was pretty terrifying, Uh, but it changed my life. And so I have great respect for these medicines because were it not for that experience at that college party, I would not have turned my life towards awakening. That's beautiful. And, and, and it feels like the, the plant medicines, right, these entheogens, whether they're actual plant medicines or fungi, are these phenomenal openers. And what is also true is a lot of people who have these experiences don't necessarily um, understand or explore their relationship to money in particular. And I'd love just as an opener for, for, for you to sort of go deeper into how do you see or, or what more specifically, what have plant medicines and fungi taught you about money and your relationship with money? I think one of the reasons why plant medicines are so powerful is because 
they're really interested in the evolution of everything. And they, they like want, they leave nothing out of their invitation to transform and evolve. So everything is welcome at the table of a psychedelic, everything, every shadow, everything that's hidden, every secret, every blind spot. Part of their power is that they make us feel more comfortable looking into the shadow aspects of our own self and therefore the shadow aspects of society. And in my experience, one of the biggest shadows in society is money. So I think that it makes, it makes perfect sense to me that the plants would like to get their hands on money because in the end, money is just a form of energy. It just happens to be a form of energy that's fraught with a lot of conflict right now. And that they would like to help us to transform that energy into something that is more in service to what really matters. And what does it <laughs> Waking <matter>? up. <laughs> like, it's like, it's like, it's <laughs> like, like the earth is a school. Like we came here to wake up. Like basically, I mean, we can, we can say that there's other reasons for being human, but I've looked into this for many, many years and <laughs> many, many journeys and many experiences. And I'm, pretty confident that the purpose of a human lifetime is to wake up as deeply as you can. So everything gets included in awakening. Nothing gets left out. Right. Because it is all encompassing, right? And in, in your talk at the conference, you mentioned not only is it money, but it's also sex and power, right? The money, sex and power are, are these three things that we have a lot of shadow around that are often fraught with conflict because of um, how much they can move, so to say, right? And, and, when, and when people who are maybe less than savory or who are not awakened have a lot of money, sex, and power, it can sometimes um, harm in some ways. And yet through, through the awakening, right, with these medicines, the idea is we can actually utilize money, sex, and power for a higher purpose that is, that is sort of conscious, that is aware, that is um, contributing back to the greater good. My experience, having spent a lot of time around uh, massive wealth, is that money amplifies what is already present in the person who's holding it. It's like a great volume knob. It turns the volume from 13 to 26 on a person. So if you are asleep in certain ways, that just becomes magnified. And if you're awake in certain ways, that also becomes magnified. So... I obviously, this is kind of my life works. I spent quite a lot of time looking at what happens to people that hold great wealth, how great wealth operates in our society. And one of the key points that I like to think about is how, particularly in American society, money has in many ways become like a form of a God. It becomes something that we worship. We spend a lot of time and effort worshiping or idolizing certain attributes or certain qualities in our society that are primarily really related to money, sex, and power. So there's something interesting which happens if you're a wealthy man and you go into a party, everybody treats you like the most important person in the room. Uh, everybody thinks your jokes are funny. Everybody thinks every comment you make is interesting. You can have any woman that you want. So the way in which we as a society actually somehow have said money is the most important thing and is the thing worth paying the most attention to. It's the sacred cow of American society is, is, is money itself. What, what gets embedded into money is, is, is sex and power. Right, so those three things, they, they kind of play in the same sandbox together. So it's not a mystery like the rich man can have as much sex as he wants. The more powerful he is, the more women he can have. Like This is very, very interrelated in our society. So I got curious about that. And I said, well, if money is just a form of energy, but it's got all of this power, what happens if that power itself begins to wake up? What does it look like if the money and the power and even the sex become more conscious, what, what would that look like? 
And that's been kind of the experiment that I've been trying to live with my life. And so bring us deeper into that because you have an interesting story. You, you weren't immediately in the, the investment and finance world. You, you explored, uh, you know, had some personal experiences in places across the globe. You also, you know, were first an entrepreneur before you started to get into investment. So just bring our listeners a little bit deeper into sort of, you know, your, your, your professional personal path between entrepreneurship, investment and awakening. After university, I moved to South America to help start a school with two other people. It's called the Oasis Institute, and it's based out of Argentina. I was an entrepreneur by accident. I was an entrepreneur because I didn't understand risk. I had nothing to lose. I had a lot of spunk and a spirit of adventure and ended up helping to create something that actually was a meaningful contribution um, and still exists today. It's trained thousands of healers and body workers and massage therapist throughout Latin America. So I was really, really proud to have basically for that to have been my first career. And as a part of that building of that school, I then also trained with different shamans and healers and body workers uh, for the first 10 years of my adult life. And, and the only thing that I really cared about in terms of my professional life was what is healing and what is awakening. And then studying with anybody that I thought could give me those tools or those codes to go deeper into that. So I was so steadfast throughout my 20s, really nothing else mattered to me except those two questions. What is healing and what is awakening? And as I kind of progressed, specifically with healing, I I, I kept digging deeper and deeper and deeper into this question of what does it mean to heal? Like, who is it that heals? What is it that's healing? And for me, I was able to discover that healing in, in its very essence is really not separate from that moment of awakening, that the, the only healing that is actually really ever real to us is the awakening of your true nature, who you truly are, which is that which is never born and never dies, that pure, profound, pristine consciousness that is your essence. Seeing that, knowing that, feeling that, understanding that, and anchoring yourself in that and living a life from that truth, that is awakening. So for me, all healing kind of comes to that one moment of awakening. And the beauty was that I was able to give myself to that fully throughout my 20s. And then at a certain point in time, I, I, it was really quite simple. I didn't really want to spend the rest of my life in South America as much as I loved it. I didn't really it's far away. I mean, I still had my family, my friends were still all based in America. And I was getting to that age where I knew that it was going to be time to marry and have children. And I didn't, if I knew if I married and I had children in South America, I would, I would essentially become Argentinian for the rest of my life. And that wasn't something that I really wanted to do. So I sold my part of the school to my two partners in 2000. And I moved back to the States I had some money from the sale of the school. It wasn't like a crazy fortune, but it was something. And I began to think about how to invest that money. It was during the dot-com boom. And at the same time I was thinking about how to invest that money, I was thinking about what I would do next in my career. And two things happened. One is I couldn't figure out how to invest the money. Uh, one is I, I felt like everybody was trying to sell me something and there was so much hysteria in the market at the time. It just didn't feel like anything I could understand or didn't feel grounded. And so I actually didn't invest in that moment and I kept everything in cash. And at the same time, I thought maybe I would go to divinity school and become ordained, or maybe I would become, you know, a clinical psychologist. I was trying to find this sort of like next stage in my career. And as I was experimenting and trying different paths, none of those things felt right. So in the end, what I did is I took a sabbatical in India. And that was probably one of the best decisions in my entire life. And I would wish that for any young person that given the kind of unknowingness of what is next or not knowing what your career path is to be is to actually give yourself the opportunity of sabbatical or a gap year or whatever you want to call it and, and kind of retreat deeper into yourself until you kind of can see what, what is, so you're not just moving forward through conditioning or societal expectations, but from this kind of place of, of connection to yourself. 
So I went to India for a prolonged trip and in, in, I stayed in this ashram in the South of India, which is, um, the ashram of Ramana Maharshi, who was one of the great gurus of India. He died in 1950. And what Ramana Maharshi was really teaching and continues to teach today through his, what he's left behind was, um, non-duality, this question, who am I and stillness and just entering into this profound rapport of knowing yourself to be that which is true. So it's a really incredible experience to live inside that ashram. I lived there for, for over two months and, uh, towards the end of those two months, I, was introduced to a, a beautiful teacher, a beautiful young teacher, um, a sadhu in India. And with this teacher, I had a really, really profound awakening. Um, the kind of awakening that you read about in books and, you know, sort of like what I had been kind of like waiting for my whole life. I wanted to have that experience where everything explodes into pure light and that, you know, your nervous system gets like blown up for two weeks. And, you know, you're, you know, I, I, so I got to have that experience. It was cool, but I'll without five, without MEO, five, DMT, yeah, it's right. like, I didn't even know five MEO existed yeah, yeah, at the time. Yeah, exactly. So I, I got, to, I got to do it the old fashioned <laughs> right. way. You see all you young listeners, this is what us old people used to have to do. We used to have to go to India for two months and sit in an ashram and find a teacher and, and, and work really super fucking hard for it. But now <laughs> you guys can just smoke some five MEO and you're going to get there way faster. <laughs> no, seriously. If I had, if I had had five MEO at this time, I never would have spent all those hours sitting in meditation. So, right, precisely. <laughs> so, you know, I had that experience, but when I, when I was coming out of it then, you know, because all experiences fade. I mean, even the most profound enlightenment experiences at some point begin to sort of stabilize and normalize into ordinary life as that was beginning to happen, it was sort of like landing the plane back on earth. I really, and again, this is where I feel like there's this great guiding hand of consciousness itself, which wants to evolve. Like there's this way in which if you give your life to awakening, everything else kind of takes care of itself. It's sort of like, it's sort of like, like, like somewhere in my, in my twenties, I must've somehow made enough prayers that was like, use me for whatever you wish. I want to wake up at any cost. Like, I want to be of service. I mean, just that simple prayer, like, I want to be of service. I must have made it enough times mm -hmm. and in enough ways for consciousness to be like, well, in that, like, you look like a good servant. We can use you. You look like a good soldier. And, and I think that at that point in India that I was somehow prepared enough for consciousness to say, you're a really great soldier. We're going to use you. Guess what? Now you're going to go and learn how to manage money. And I, I can tell you, like, it was, it was, for me, it was, it was about the most insane thing that I could, like, like, it was akin to being like, now you're going to learn to be a gold miner or like, now you're going to be an oligarch <laughs> or like, it was just so like complete, I was completely unprepared in every single way. Um, and and terrified and terrified, um, like I had no idea how I would even do that. What what was terrifying? Yeah, w what was the fear in that? At the time, money still felt very foreign and very separate, and it felt like it had nothing to do with spirituality. Um, it felt incomprehensible to me. Uh, I didn't even like math, <laughs> like for starters. <laughs> <laughs> like, like of all the things you could possibly tell me to do, what'd you, what'd you study? What, what'd you study? Like what, before, prior to getting into money management, like in, what, what environmental were you studies and poetry? Like, like yeah, Perfect. like nothing at all, like not even close. So that, that was a oh. real uphill. That was a real uphill, um, journey for me in particular. And, 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 and the only reason why I share the story is, is like, I don't think anything I've done is so special or important, but I want other women to hear the story and either feel like they can become financially empowered themselves for them to feel like, um, finances are not separate from God 
And then maybe for some women, I want them to be like, wow, actually, I think I want to manage money too. I didn't know the difference between a stock and a bond when I had the vision that it was my destiny to become a money manager. So you were just that, that separate from it. It was that not, I mean, like, yeah, I had some you. money in the bank. Like I knew how to, ba- I knew how sure. to not overspend. I knew how to not be in debt. Like I could balance a budget, but right. I mean, investing, I knew nothing about it. You know, this, and <clears throat> so my background, which I've shared with the listeners before, but the relevance of this is I grew up middle class, West Michigan, Dutch, frugal, money was always a weird thing, right? And even in my early psychedelic experiences, it was always about sort of the efficiency of money. In other words, you know, I lived in Turkey for a year. I lived in Thailand for a year, Portugal, Mexico, all over for like five, six years and was always around how can I get the most out of it? so to say, but not necessarily look at it as a driver and of, and of, of, of good, right? I, I had this sort of separation from money. I didn't necessarily perceive it as evil, but as less than necessary. And yet what I've come to find through my entrepreneurial path is that money as a resource, like you said, it's a resource, it's an energy. It can be very helpful in terms of what it can build and create. Now, you also, you also mentioned the dot-com boom, right in the in the early 2000s that you were considering investing in and there's a lot of overlap or parallels between the current psychedelic boom and the dot com boom so to say and so i'm just curious like you have this awakening you uh you you start to look at how you can manage money what's the path then for you from committing to that right managing money to choosing the psychedelic industry as a a space that you want to be involved with and that you want to invest in. Like, I think those of us who are sort of in it and close to it, we're like, wow, this is a little bit crazy, but this is minuscule, microscopic compared to what it, it potentially could be one day. Um, that being said, you know, I feel I have a very forgiving and and compassionate view towards psychedelic investing right now. I think it's like, Like any space that has so much potential in it is going to become frothy and overcapitalized and it's going to get messy along the way. I think that there will be people that lose money um, and there will be people who make money. And in the end, so much of that is going to be luck and timing. So the thing that I try to pay the most attention to is is really understanding the fundamentals of the science as much as I can. If you're looking at drug development, it's these are biotech companies, so I really don't think they should be invested in in any different way than a, you would in a biotech company. So if you're going to be a psychedelic investor and you're investing in companies like Compass, you should school yourself on what the process really looks like for a drug to become approved by the FDA you know, where are they in their clinical studies? Do they have any kind of real IP? Do they have a moat around it? Do they have an orphan indication? I mean, these are biotech companies. So for me, yes, some of these valuations are crazy and frothy, but you can still be a good value investor in the space. Um, as, as, you know, that's, that's just me putting on my investor hat. Um, where it gets complicated is, is, that there's other parts of this ecosystem which are more about um, safe access and and um, you know just legalizing and you know getting getting these into the hands of facilitators and 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 people and you know like like there's some like uh, you know the drug development is for like depression or cluster headaches or you know um, specific medical imbalances. But the, the other side of psychedelics is just about access, is about safe access. And I really don't think there's any investment theme there. And I think that it, it's foolhardy to try to invest in that thesis. I, I just want it to be, I just want, I just want, like, I, in that particular side, all I'm really interested in is investing in the companies that are going to train the, you know, 50 to 100,000 facilitators that we're going to need as these things become legalized. We just need to get really, really good facilitators trained. But I don't think anyone should be trying to profit from the, um, broader consumer, you know, access of psychedelics. 
you know, it, 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 well, it's, it's, it's a tricky balance, right? I mean, it's a, it's a tricky balance, but, you know, I study with this lineage of, of ayahuasqueros who have been in the jungle, you know, for thousands of years, literally who have like master mm-hmm. medicine, mm-hmm. master processes. Like you tell me how you, you don't ever commercialize that. You can't commercialize that. Um, all you can do is legalize it. Mm-hmm. That's it. Like, I don't, I don't know how, how do you commercialize ayahuasca? How do you commercialize, you know, a tribe of shamans? who, who are holding a lineage and holding teachings. And do you see what I'm saying? It's like, I don't see any commercialization thesis around, around that. Like, the, and I think that that's, what's beautiful is that there's some part of the plant medicines that, that belong, belong to the, belongs to the earth and belongs to the people. And this is where the conversation in the psychedelic space comes back to reciprocity and indigenous representation and the importance of, you know, engaging in dialogue. I had, on the podcast recently, Mark Plotkin, who's an ethnobotanist, uh, who wrote a book, Tales of a Shaman's Apprentice, has lived in the Amazon for a long time. And, and we we got into this conversation as well around just sort of the emerging psychedelic renaissance and how, you know, there might be people who sort of do a hat tip or sort of a virtue signaling around reciprocity, but that um, it requires actually a, a certain level of politeness, so to say, and and a willingness to listen and communicate that I think we we're not seeing with most biotech companies, um, but that we are seeing with more of whether it's the nonprofits or even some of the poor for-profit companies that are taking a, um, a more long-term approach, we could say. And they, they're really like, what is the vision for the next 30 to 40 years that we're holding to ensure that this space emerges with integrity, that it emerges with uh, sort of the divine intelligence that we want inside of it, that it emerges with, like you said, facilitators and people who can hold space because this could go sideways very quickly, like it did in the sixties. And a lot of it comes down to the integrity and the wisdom that we continue to sort of hold within the, the emergency. Yeah, and the, and the two sides have to respect each other's role because the truth is, is that none of this gets legalized without the biotech companies putting out the data or the John Hopkins of the world doing the clinical studies. And, you know, the, 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 they have a role to play, right? I mean, so, so I think that they have to, you know, in my, in my mind, they have to, they have to respect each other. And I think that they, they fulfill different purposes that are, you know, that are, that are important. But for me, look, I look at the biotech thesis as more of, um, you know, one is some of the science is actually really beneficial and important. So if you, you know, if you think about a company like WeSana, which is looking at using psilocybin for traumatic brain injury, it's, that's, that's important. Like we need, we need to capitalize companies that are going to understand how to really properly dose psilocybin for um, athletes that have experienced multiple concussions, for example. I mean, th- this is real science, and they shouldn't be judged by any other parameters than we would judge any other um, biotech company. It's just not fair to them. And it's, 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 it's not fair. Like, they are developing drugs with specific indications, and, and we need that on the planet. Like, we need science. It's important. On, on the other side, you know, is, is, is in the theme of access and the theme of, of kind of awakening the people, you know, I'm on the, I'm on the board of, a, of Beckley Waves. So Beckley, as you know, the Beckley Foundation is, is this research institute. Beckley SciTech is their drug development arm. Beckley Waves is where they're developing um, models for training of facilitators. And they're also developing um, models for retreats, sort of like best in class psychedelic retreats, uh, using psilocybin specifically and based out of Jamaica where it's already legal. So w- the conversations that we have with in Beckley Waves are, for example, is that, you know, we can't just be doing retreats that are for high end paying clients, but we have to balance them with access to these retreats for, um, war veterans or even local, um, community members in Jamaica. So, so that's like, I don't think I'm articulating it pretty well, but you know, when I'm investing on the drug development side, I'm really looking at it like a pure investor in a biotech company. When I'm looking at it in the, in the community side, you know, I will happily facilitate personally, um, you know, retreats 
free of cost for some of the community members in Jamaica because that's our duty. That's our responsibility. We are, we're holding ceremony on their land. Um, and, and we want the community to be included, not just drop in, you know, use their place and then drop out. So I look at it separately. And yet, what we learn from psychedelics or what we learn from awakening, let's say, is there is no separation, right? Everything is interconnected. There are no, you know, any, any separation is artificial at the end of the day. And so I'm just curious, like, you know, from your perspective, are there any companies in the space? And I guess Beckley, we could be point to Beckley as one of them, right? Because they are the nonprofit with the Beckley Foundation. They rolled out SciTech and they're doing drug development. They're now doing Beckley waves, like you said, with retreats and community but I feel like this this beautiful intersection of the the science with the community, so to say, is is the ideal of what we're looking for. In other words, what companies can both um, pioneer cutting edge science that's going to move sort of the the medicinal element forward while still recognizing the importance of community in the healing process, right? Because I think the the downside somewhat to the biotech is that it the the me, the Western medical model tends to be very focused on individual let's say individual um, indications rather than the relationship of the individual to the larger community. And the challenge with the community side of things is a lot of people would say that it's sort of painted a little bit too much with drug decriminalization or, you know, far left social justice stuff, whereas the community is just sort of central to the healing element. So I, I feel like there's a way that you know merging those two is is really important to, again, the integrity of how this develop, so to say? I mean, I definitely don't know the answer, but if I think about using psilocybin for treatment resistant depression, right. And, you know, like, what is like, what, what is that? What is that? Like, yes, we really want there to be safe protocols and proper dosing and legalization. And that's all great. But in the end, like depression is also is a societal ill, right? It's a, it's a, it's, it, it, it should be healed inside of a community context also. Right. And what's the point of like, like, I, 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 I'm not an expert in depression, but to me, like where I see so much benefit with the, with people that are using plant medicine and who are experiencing a lessening of anxiety and depression, it's not happening in a clinic with a bullet. It's happening because they're doing this in, in ceremonies that are part of a larger community where they feel this sort of like inclusiveness and they, they have this reminder of the we and they have this reminder of, of that they're, you know, that we're, we're not doing this journey alone. Um, but I, I mean, I really, I really don't, I really don't know how, how it's going to play out. And I really don't know what's the correct course of action overall. I can only speak to like the things that I actually am involved in and I know, and I can only talk about the sort of ethical compass that I use in different environments. So I want to come back to this, but, but before we come back to this, I just, I want to open up a bit of a different lens and that's this, this concept of investing in a shamanic way, right? And this is, this is sort of the, the title of the, the talk that was given at the microdosing conference. I think for a lot of people, when they see it, they're a little confused. And I know we've already, we've talked quite a bit about investment and money. We've also talked now about shamanism and lineages. And I'd be curious if you could just explain that phrase, investing in a shamanic way. What does that, what does that mean to you? Well, first of all, is, is breaking down the barriers between, um, what we think is shamanic and what's not shamanic, right? Because in the end, the, the shaman is the one who's the seer. And what it means to be the seer is it's the one who's able to look at the energy pattern underlying things. He's the one who can, he's the pattern reader, right? He's the pattern reader. He's the energy seer and the pattern reader. And when I think about what makes a really great visionary venture capitalist, a lot of what makes a venture capitalist phenomenal is they're also a seer. They can see what kind of a company is going to transform society or what's going to make a huge impact in the world. And, and probably, and I don't think a lot of venture capitalists talk about this so overtly. They like to say, oh, we're founder focused. Do you hear that a lot? I'm founder focused. Well, what does it really mean to be founder focused? Well, it means that you have to really be a good judge of character and you have to be really have a, a pretty strong um, sense of empathy or intuition around who people are 
and being able to line yourself up with those founders and take the journey with them. So when I say, okay, if a venture capitalist is looking at the pattern of what kind of a company is going to make an impact in the world, and if he's, if he's looking at a founder and saying, who is this person and can I take the journey with them? And then the shaman over here is looking inside of the energy pattern of a person and saying, why is this person suffering or why is this person sick or where, where does this person need to make an adjustment to thrive? They're looking at patterns and they're actually deeply intuitive about the people that they're working with. So I don't understand why it would be so surprising that those two things could actually be completely, um, synergistic together. It's just that it's such a like, holy cow, like investing is like, you know, like, like, Oh, like investing is like so sacred. Like, Oh, it's like such a, you know, like God forbid you ever say that, like, like that investing could actually be intuitive and simple and, and, and your birthright. Imagine if it was our birthright to really know how to be good investors. What? Like, imagine if you didn't have to outsource that to an expert. So I think it's a bit of it's it it can be a bit shocking for people, but when you really think about it, why would it be shocking? It should be completely um, natural and intuitive that you could you could bring together those skills. Kind of reminds me of the word stewards, right? If we were to play replace the word investor with the word stewards, which I think most, if investors are let's say investing in that shamanic way, they're they're really looking at how can they be stewards of the psychedelic movement or stewards of a revolution in mental health or stewards of whatever else it is. Right. And that almost requires a framing that is rooted in awakening because oftentimes through awakening, we realize it's not about us necessarily as an individual, but instead of what is moving through us, the divine, right. And the divine wants to contribute. The divine wants to be stewards of this greater thing that, you know, the earth, community, whatever we're sort of playing with or, or existing within. I can just share with you like my own sort of personal uh, antidote about how it started was, you know, remember I'm like at this, like this is, this is about two and a half, three years ago. I'm a portfolio manager. And at the time I'm working in a bank, which is just about the most compliance heavy environment you've ever been in in your life. And then on my vacations, I'm going to South America and I'm working with these, you know, in particular with Taito Anita with these great shamans and, but nobody really knows that I'm doing that. It's like, these things are really quite separate in my life at that time. And I would be sitting in these ceremonies and I would, whether like there was like, there's, I mean, there's a certain point where like, like it was almost like this, this is how every ceremony started to go. In the beginning, I would have to, you know, come into integrity in something in my life, like whatever it was, like my kid is spending too much time on his iPad. I'd have to like come into integrity or, you know, I didn't treat, you know, my ex-husband kindly. I'd have to come into integrity, like wherever I needed to come into integrity. It was always like the first two hours of every ceremony was sort of like just me cleaning up my messes. And, and coming into full integrity and seeing where it is that I needed to be more um, true. And when that had kind of like settled down, this sort of like, like housekeeping, it's like ayahuasca housekeeping, um, whenever that kind of like had like settled itself out, when I had like purged all of like my sins into the bucket, I would come always into this sort of place of like utter stillness. It was like being in the silver desert, just like utter total stillness. And, and in that stillness would come what they call like the consulta or the consultations. And, and these consultations, they could sometimes just be consultations that were for other people that were not related to money. But increasingly what was so amazing is every single consultation would just be about money. And every single consultation would be about investing. And it was like the grandmother was showing me down to the most minute details. I would literally sit in ceremonies and the grandmother would walk me through incentive structures on deals and show me how the incentivization was aligned with truth or was not aligned with truth. It was like at that level of detail. And as much as I, it gets kind of weird in the beginning. I was like, wow, I'm just like literally like spending half of my ceremonies looking at investing that it was, 
it was like a love affair. Like I loved what I was being shown. It felt like the most precious knowledge I could possibly be given was this sort of like sacred understanding of the nature of money and the nature of investing and, and, and what, what the, what consciousness wants and what God wants is just incredible support and abundance for everybody. Like they, this isn't about like investing in a way where you get less, but you feel good about it. It was like, no, this is like, this is a way in which everybody wins. The planet wins, the people win, everybody wins. But it was showing me in all this kind of detail how that actually had to operate and how it actually had to function. So all of it really came from deep seeing and ceremony. I've had similar experiences, not specific to investing, just because I'm not necessarily an investor. I'm much more entrepreneur creative, but very, very similar things in terms of let's say for third wave, right? With the vision that we've built or third wave and synthesis, the companies and the sort of ecosystem that, that I've been able to develop. It's been how do those pieces all come together to form like a one plus one equals three, right? Even the name synthesis is, is you know, the coming together of pieces for, for a greater good. And there seems to be an ability both to feel that, like in terms of what feels good in the chest and the gut and the entire body, but also quantify it to make it actually executable. So there are clear steps from, let's say, current reality to envisioned mm -hmm. reality, right? Because so much of, let's say, investing or so much of the entrepreneurial path as a visionary is holding what is that imagined reality and being able to have the sort of wherewithal to bring a team or bring a company or whatever it is mm -hmm. into that, which is very difficult. And psychedelics help to facilitate that that process more than anything that that I've personally worked with. You know, breath work or ice or floats or whatever. Psychedelics continue to to deliver on sort of clearing the clouds to see what is that that peak, both individually and collectively, that we're aiming for. That's beautiful. Thank you for sharing that because I don't always like to talk about these things because you know there's just like so many people that could think it's crazy. And, and I'm like, that's cool. You could think it's crazy, but, <laughs> but you know, I just want to say like, ayahuasca has been, people have been drinking it for thousands of years. And, you know, right. historically, like if somebody was sick in the village, they drank in ceremony to see what was happening. If they were going to go on a hunt, they drank in ceremony to see where the animals were. Like this is, it's a practical <laughs> medicine. It's, it will, it will kick your butt. It will school you. It will floor you. It will give you the keys to God, but it also loves being used practically because in the end, consciousness wants to evolve in a very ordinary way on the planet. Like if consciousness can't evolve in the building of a company or in an investing of money or in how I parent, if it's not going to be able to teach me at these mm. practical levels how to do better, then what's the point? Then all we're doing is tripping. All we're doing is tripping and hanging out with a bunch of fractals and then telling each other stories about it. Like, who cares about that? Like, literally, like, don't care. I mean, that's huh? fun. You know, that's that can, it can, that can be fun, but that's the much more feminine element, right? The the connection, the 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 visions, the where I've always been is very masculine in terms of the, I want structure. I want, to, I want a clear path that I can execute against. I want to have a clear sense of where, where is my objective reality, right? Because even what psychedelics help to do through the ego dissolution process is actually just be honest with yourself. Like you were saying, when you were working with ayahuasca, you had to come clean about all these things that had happened in the past that brought you out of integrity. And I feel like part of that cleansing process is allowing us to sort of sink in to a place where it's like, oh yeah, this is true. This is the vision that I want. This is where I'm lacking or this is where I'm not sort of fully owning up to what I need to be. And I'm, I'll shift and move that energy to find gr greater alignment. Because ultimately at the end of the day, it's about alignment mm. between yourself and the vision that you, that you want to create. And not only between yourself and the vision that you want to create, but I think back to your point earlier, right? What makes VCs shamans, so to say, in terms of seers are recognizing how that relates to larger things going on, right? One of the reasons Steve Jobs is so successful is because he built something that because he knew this future would be digitized, right? So he's like, if I build Apple and this computer, 
a lot of the sort of um, the attractor point of the future, the digitization of society will pull me into that. And I feel like we're going through something similar with psychedelics, where the future is decentralized, the future is open source, the future is Web3, the future is whatever else you want to name it. And psychedelics seem to be fitting into that larger Mm -hmm. evolution of where we're going, where consciousness is headed, so to say. I couldn't agree more. Like I think one of one of the the most amazing things that I've seen happen in my lifetime is just the concept of a DAO. I mean, imagine like that's just like what what tell tell our listeners what so, is a DAO. Okay, okay. So some, I, some I, know, again, but some I, maybe maybe I, you don't know, know. As an investor, I try to like figure these things out sooner rather than later. So I'm still at the beginning right. of understanding. But my understanding is is a yeah. doubt, which is just basically is a it's a decentralized authority organization. But what does that mean practically? So let's say that I want to buy a token in a company that's decentralized. Um, let's say, or it doesn't even have to be a company; it could be like an asset. So let's let's use an example. Um, mm-hmm. Let's say that uh, we want to buy this land in Miami, or maybe that's not that's not a fun example. Mm-hmm. Let's say you know, I don't know, let's say, let's say, let's say we want to, we want to create our own Uber. I think that's a fun example, right? Let's create our own Uber. So we can now, first of all, we don't need Uber in the middle anymore because we can, these contracts, we can now let these contracts and all these transactions can actually go between the Uber driver and the person who needs the ride. So we no longer need the intermediary of Uber taking a percentage of that in the middle. So that's great because now the Uber drivers can actually earn more, but then let's say there's some infrastructure or there's some, there's some other, there's some other maybe development costs that need to be born to make this a reality. So we can then buy the token uh, of that underlying infrastructure. And so that the development and the coding of that infrastructure is supported by the contributions or by us buying the token. And then when decisions need to be made, and this is the part that I find most exciting because I probably just did this whole hack job of describing how the actual coding part works. But the, the part that I love is that decisions can happen through the collective so that all of us that hold these, these tokens in this, in this decentralized company, we get to decide how the company makes its decisions through the collective. And that, that for me is so exciting because if you think about it, it, it means that we could start to have like, I don't know what the future is going to look like, but imagine in like, like, I mean, me personally in the future, I would like to see no banks exist anymore. I would like all the banks to die. I hope, especially JP Morgan and Goldman Sachs. Why is that? Because, <laughs> Why is because, that? <laughs> because they really have, um, because they're centralized power over money. Um, they limit access to, um, opportunities and deals like they say that they represent investors best interests but in the end they they as an organism represent their own best interest they have to survive they have an immune system they're interested primarily in their own existence and then the shareholder for them is really what matters and then the you know the retail investors in the end are secondary to that at least that's how i see it and so if you think about organizations like that no longer existing and like I don't know. I'm just really excited about a, a day. Again, this is like very future thinking. But why wouldn't there be a day where we don't need there to be a bank anymore if we want to take a loan? What if we can start our businesses by lending to each other? What if, what if you no longer have to, you know, be a super sophisticated, super wealthy investor to get access to, you know, early stage venture companies? Why, why can't we? Why can't I invest? hundred dollars in an early stage venture company through a coin. I mean, just, I just love the fact that, that in the future, that there's this mechanism by which all of this power can be redistributed. And therefore also all this opportunity can be redistributed. But again, like there are people who are way more knowledgeable than I am in this space and can speak with it with more elegance. I just watching it from the sidelines and, and I'm just a good cheerleader for the people that are actually going to revolutionize the world of finance. Well, it feels like there's there's some interesting through lines there between DAOs and even you know psychedelic companies, so to say, right? In terms of where where, where I where I look as a CEO of a, a company in this space, what I'm focused on more than anything is is community, right? And and. <laughs> 
what I'm focused on more than anything is community and, and creating a community focused or a community first platform, because ultimately the, the, the community is where you'll find, um, that's who you're going to serve, right? Again, coming back to this notion of stewardship and investment, I'd rather invest in people. I'd rather invest in land. I'd rather invest in tangible things as a way to grow and develop, let's say a future. I, I even love what I've been getting into lately are, uh, is this concept of networked states, uh, which has been sort of talked about by a guy named Balaji's, where he talks about how in the future, you know, the, the, we're going from nation states to networked states, and those will be essentially, you know, bought through communities with a coin where you could buy 50 acres in Costa Rica, you could buy, yeah, you know, yeah. an apartment in Miami, yeah. you could buy a place in Russia. And all of a sudden now you have a, you have a coin, you have a community, you have a, you have a mission, so to say, of what you're creating and building. And, um, this, this, this solves, let's say a lot of problems in that again, where, where a lot of people are at right now in terms of mental health or what they're struggling with is a lot of it comes down to lack of community. A lot of it comes down to loneliness and a sense of disconnection. And so I feel like that is in large part, the opportunity with, with this larger psychedelic space. It's how are we investing in more tangible assets? Cause I often see money as being very mm -hmm, abstract, mm -hmm. right? And so how do we how do we invest in wealth that isn't just purely numbers on a spreadsheet, but is also something much more tangible in terms of people, connection, earth, land, et cetera, et cetera. This is beautiful vision. I love that. I feel like I don't want to speak out of turn and like talk about things that I'm not really an expert in. And I can honestly say that I'm, I'm looking at right now, you know, in the world of, of the development of blockchain I'm looking at real revolutionaries, real visionaries with a lot of awe and a lot of respect. And I feel like my, my particular role or my contribution is I feel like I'm kind of like the grandmother at this point. And so I, <laughs> you know, I, I, what I am, what I am skilled at is facilitating, um, via particularly via plant medicine, um, journeys, facilitating the deepening of awakening and the um, support of of a visionary's consciousness, right? So, like that's really what I understand. I guess so I can be like, I know who I know who I want to spend time with and who I want to support. Like, I know who I want. I know who I want to. Um, I know who I want to be on the cheerleading team for. I'll say that. So, like, you know, I don't. I I as a facilitator, I never charge for my facilitation work. I do it for free. Um, I've always, I've always done it for free and I will always continue. I will never charge for my facilitation work because I feel like if I can mm. just with the little bit that I know about being a good plant medicine facilitator, if I can be a catalyst or just be a little tiny spark behind these great and amazing visionaries who are either building you know, coding, building, transforming society. Um, that's, that's kind of where I see, I see my best role. And then as an investor is, you know, I, I, I really am lucky because I get to meet people like that and I get to see what they're doing and I, I get to come into their deals and, you know, that's, I don't, it's like a virtuous circle, if that makes sense. Like, I feel like my role is primarily to like help with the awakening of the consciousness. And then the beauty of that is what comes back to me on the, on the, on the other side is I get in tremendous visibility into, um, early stage transformative world changing companies and I get to invest in them. It's the best of everything, <laughs> right? And I think this is, this is even, this is even a not as widely held conversation at this point in time, because the focus of psychedelics have been so much on mental health. And yet this is my, you know, continues to be my personal mission as well. It's how do we transform leadership as we know it through psychedelic use and through awakening? Um, because I really go on the thesis that it doesn't require a majority, you know, of people awakening in this lifetime to shift things on a systemic level. It only requires, let's say 10% because that shift is exponential. It's, it's nonlinear, so to say. Um, and so I, I'm, I'm really curious about what is that relationship between awakening 
and leadership? And then even more particularly, how does that relate to the psychedelic space? And this is sort of the last question that I want to have for you before we wrap up is, is what do you think of, do you think it's important for, let's say, CEOs of psychedelic companies, executive teams of psychedelic companies, those who are working in the space to have experiences yes. with this, yes. these medicines? Or do you think? I mean, yeah, I get asked okay. that question all the time. I'm like, <laughs> same more, I mean, same it's, more, it's same actually more, a same. really annoying question at this point. I'm like, nobody has any business leading a psychedelic company if you don't have firsthand profound experience in psychedelics. I mean, I can't even like, it's incomprehensible to me that, that that's even happening. Because you, you, there's so much guidance, like the plants themselves have an agenda and we are in collaborative conversation with their agenda. Like psilocybin is part of the evolutionary path of mankind. Like it is out of the kindness of their little fungal heart that they even want to, want to help us. Like, like. The fungi are so freaking awake, okay? They're immortal. And then they're like, you know what? Like, let's help the humans out. They are collaborating with us in our evolution. So if you're going to, I mean, the idea that you're going to like extract some psilocybin and make a product out of it and sell it without actually having gotten on your knees and respected the incredible, profound, collective, eternal unbelievable wisdom of the psilocybin is reprehensible. And, and I don't, and I'm a pretty, I'm a pretty open-minded forgiving person, but if you're leading a psychedelic company and you haven't had some really good journeys, God bless you. <laughs> <laughs> and there's no, there's no, you can't start too late. Good In now. other words, it, you know, like, it, it, yeah, you, we know Sylvia facilitates, you know, for, for world changing leaders, <laughs> blah, 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 blah. I'm just kidding. I don't think, I don't think this is a good, good time to make that, that connection. But I, 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 I agree with you. And I feel like what it speaks to, again, it comes back to integrity and it comes back to like, like we were talking about, right? Psychedelics, they can help with the quantitative, they can help with the vision, the execution, but more so they help with the the sort of deeper intuitive knowing, and having been in this space myself for six years, I've gone through quite a few ups and downs. It was not, you know, I didn't make really any money from it for probably four of those years just because of it's too early on. And what always kept me going is the personal experience itself. In other words, I would have quit a much a lot before if it was just for these external reasons. But I find what to be what what is what is true of many of the leaders that I love in the psychedelic space is there's a deeper thing that's driving them. And often it's that relationship or that experience, profound experience that they've had with these, these medicines. For the record, I haven't actually made money from psychedelics at all because, um, most of the companies that I'm invested in are not public. There's one that's public, but it's not doing great. Won't mention which, and you know, and I, I don't take compensation for, a for board seat, for example. Um, I don't charge for my facilitation and I have nothing to sell. So guess what? I actually make zero money from psychedelics at this stage. But the the beauty is that I've been able to work with founders of companies of, um, and and I've been able to go on the journey of some companies that have gone from the private markets to the public markets. Companies not related to psychedelics, just companies. You know, amazing, beautiful mm-hmm. companies mm-hmm. that I've been able to be a part of the capitalization of and 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 help you know, burden to the public markets. And that's been incredible for me because we've, we've gone on that journey together, um, you know, deeply connected and deeply counseled, um, by plant medicine. So it's come to me in, in other ways, but the bottom line is, is respect the plants and be in communication with the plants and, and don't, don't get arrogant about it because the plants, um, you know, like, they've got equal, equal billing with us humans in this journey. Yeah. And if you, if you get too far out ahead of yourself or think you're too above them, then come, yeah, yeah, exactly. Come, come, and... come drink some <laughs> Yahe with us and see what's going on in Colombia. Oh God, yahe. That's, that's beyond ayahuasca. <laughs> well, my, yeah, no, my, the, the, the lineage uh... I study with is a Yahe lineage. So anyone who feels like they're, they're got, yeah. Colombia. Yeah, to anyone who would like, come, come, come drink in Colombia. You'll see what's up. <laughs> <sighs>
I remember my first yahe was at Rhythmia. I don't think it was Taito Juanito, but it was it was another Colombian shaman. It might have no, it wasn't it wasn't Taito Juanito, but another one. And I just remember there was like a leaf in there and it was like so viscous. I haven't had ayahuasca that thick since then. It's uh even just talking about it yeah, kind of makes funny. Makes it's, me a little sick. I know. Just, I was like, of all of all the lineages I could have chosen to study with, you know, go figure. <laughs> but I, I wouldn't yeah, have it any other way. Most intense yeah, I one. wouldn't have it any other way. It's like beautiful. very pure, beautiful path. Well, I really wanted to say, yeah. like, I really, well, I really any, appreciate like the the depth yeah. of your understanding and your questions. And and for me, it's it's mm. just such a rare treat to speak with someone who who really. Um, has his own embodied knowledge and is really holding something mm. deeper than just an intellectual understanding. So I just want to acknowledge that and, and appreciate you for that. Thank you, Sylvia. And I, I want to return that and reciprocate that. I feel like with, you know, I, I, I knew of your work and did a little bit of research before this podcast. And even I was like interested in this relationship between money and investment and psychedelics and shamanism and just talking with you about it for the last hour has been illuminating in, in many ways. So I just appreciate your path and the perspective that you're bringing to this space and the fun that you're having with it. I can tell it for you, it's obviously, it is a path and it's a mission, but you also enjoy it, which, which is good because these are serious medicines and they're also medicines meant for play and connection mm. and exploration yeah beautiful well thank you thanks so much for watching if you want to stay up to date on the third wave of psychedelics subscribe to this channel and visit the thirdwave.co where you'll find plenty of free resources on intentional and responsible psychedelics